A conservative federal judge shouted down by students at Stanford University. Politicians deplatformed by Twitter. These are examples of what's come to be known as cancel culture. Hello, I'm Jeff M. Brown, legal writer with the State Bar of Wisconsin. I'm here today with Pre Professor Francisca Coleman, who is an assistant professor of constitutional law at the University of Wisconsin Law School. She's also the associate director of the East Asian Legal Studies Center. Professor Coleman has written widely and lectured on cancel culture, and she will take part in a panel discussion on cancel culture during the opening plenary at the annual meeting and conference in Milwaukee on June 14th. Welcome, Professor Coleman. Thank you. So in your academic paper on cancel culture, you describe two narratives around public debates over the social regulation of speech, consequence culture and cancel culture. Can you talk a little bit about those and tell us what the difference differences between the two categories are? Yes. So cancel culture is a term that kind of has some assumptions baked into it. And the assumptions baked into it is that the speech being challenged is offensive speech. Like it's speech that has been criticized or condemned based on some kind of subjective uh, criteria. Um, and it's also baked into that is the idea that even if this speech is harmful in some subjective or maybe mildly objective way, it's not so harmful that government regulation is required. Um, and so part of the cancel culture narrative is the idea that this is kind of subjective and that it is anti to our commitment to free speech, okay? On the other hand, consequence culture is an idea that speech is not harmless and that sometimes words are, um, that they can inflict violence, um, that words injure individuals and that it's not just about offense, but it's actually about speech that is objectively in some way injurious to not just the individuals who hear the speech, but also to the communities of which they may be a part because it creates an atmosphere of denigration and intimidation. Um, one example of this that I mentioned in the paper is when the Holocaust Museum released a statement saying the Holocaust begin with words, right? And so there is this idea that words actually are kind of a precursor um, to violence and in some cases actually injurious in and of themselves. And so those are kind of the two sides of the narrative. And so if you are a, a consequence culture person, you think that harms are being done and the government actually has an obligation, you know, to regulate, to prevent actual harm to, to, to individuals and that it's not actually counter or contrary to free speech, that free speech has always allowed um, sanctions for speech that is objectively uh, harmful, the kind of fire in a crowded uh, crowded theater. Well, that's a great segue into my next question because all of us who've been through Kamala know about yelling fire in the crowded theater or fighting words, as in I'm gonna punch you in the face right now. And I'm wondering, those are words that were spoken in a rose in a mid 20th century, 19th century context. Uh, we're not in that context anymore. We have social media. And I'm wondering, is it your opinion as someone who's a constitutional law scholar and has written about cancel culture, is it time to maybe update the concept of fighting words and crying fire in a crowded theater? Because crying you can cry fire in a crowded theater without even being in that theater now in one sense. And so I'm wondering, what do you think of, of that? Should it, should those standards be updated? And what role does social media play in the rise of the, uh, in the rise of all these dynamics that surround cancel culture? Yeah, so I think the standards probably do need to be updated. One example that I give to my students is incitement, right? Incitement is actually sanctionable speech, but it requires like imminence, right? Like whatever illegal action you are threatening uh, must be kind of imminent. Like when I'm telling you, you know, let's go shoot the people up, you need to kind of be able to right away go and act on that kind of illegal advocacy. The problem with social media, of course, is how do we evaluate imminence, right? I mean, at what, you know, we don't, it's it's going to so many different people. It's on the internet forever. Um, and so, you know, some people feel, felt as though, you know, speech related to kind of to terrorism, to, you know, things like, you know, riots and 
you know, the January 6th situation, that there was actually some speech, not just Trump's um, speech um, at the Capitol, but their speech on social media that kind of feeds into this. And that actually is a form of incitement, but because of the distance between the speaker and the listener and the time delay and that there's no real temporal dimension, we don't, we can't get eminence over for, you know, kind of advocacy of illegal acts that take place over social media. So in some ways, yes. So that's an example that maybe we do need to upgrade and update the standards. Um, in terms of you know, the difference that social media makes, um, I think it's not just social media. I think it's the fact that we carry cameras and recording devices with us everywhere, right? And so there are some things that you would say, you know, around the dinner table or in a restaurant, you know, at the dinner table in a restaurant, even if you're in public, that would not really go very far. Maybe the person next to you knows you or your boss and that might get around, but it was impossible at that time for a diner sitting across from you to kind of hear this recorded and then share it with the entire world. Um, and so there are a lot of kind of instances of offensive speech that prior to social media would have remained in a very small community. Um, but now, and, and sometimes, you know, different communities have different norms. And so maybe that community would decide, ah, oh, you know, we're all rude like that all the time, or we're just, we're a racist community or whatever, right? And it wouldn't make waves, but actually now it gets beyond that community um, to people who have come from very different discursive norms. And that I think creates some of the, some of the tension. And so social media plays a huge role because speech that was in one community now goes to another community so easily. And also speech that would never have seen the light of day. I think of one example, there was um, these um, kind of from older, you know, back in the day, I think there was some kind of um, convention and two guys sitting behind a woman at the convention made a very off color joke. Now, if you have, you know, camera, you take a picture of them, right? And it goes all around the world. Whereas before, you know, it's just like, oh my God, those rude people and you would just move. But I think this way of capturing those, you know, kind of moments when we're not on, you know, um, is, is definitely a function. And then the social media makes it possible to, for those non-on moments to just become, um, uh, sources for for public debate and, and dialogue well and it seems to me that all of that is uh accentu accentuated or exacerbated on, on college campuses because you have uh early adopters of a lot of these social media technologies you have people in their late teens early 20s whose forebrains the seat of judgment is not done growing until it's 25 and talk a little bit about some of the unique things that come to cancel culture occurring on college campuses which you know, juxtapose everything I just said about the students with, you know, this is where we want people to be thinking critically and exposing people to new ideas and engaging in the debate. We, we historically have regarded, especially our public institutions as, as um, you know, markets of ideas. So talk a little bit about how that, how that plays out on college campuses. Yeah, college campuses are interesting. And so one of the things that I also tell my students is college campuses are interesting because we have so much residential segregation. You know, I asked my students to raise their hands, you know, if they went to a school that was a high school that was 90% one race and literally maybe except for two or three people in a class of 90 students, you know, everyone raised their hands. And so what happens then on college campuses is that for many times you have, this is the first time that you actually get high levels of diversity, right? People coming from different socioeconomic statuses, a lot more racial diversity than most students, you know, particularly, you know, Wisconsin, right? We kind of have a lot of, you know, rural, small towns, and I think many other places, students who come from, you know, areas that are not very diverse. And so this is the first time that they're in close connection and kind of intimate, you know, um, discursive distance with people who are so dramatically different um, from them. So for some students, this is the first time, you know, that these issues um, are, are arising. So you have this kind of, for many students, unprecedented levels of diversity and difference. But then also, you know, they don't actually have any coping strategies, right? Um, that we don't, you know, in high schools, you know, I think one of the Supreme Just Justices kind of found it laughable, right? That we would try to teach cross-cultural understanding, you know, in school. 
but they don't actually have the tools right to kind of navigate this new diverse environment but at the same time I feel like this generation you know these are generation of students who kind of learned about the failures of past social movements about the dangers of silence you know that it wasn't just the perpetrators right it was you know MLK you know the moderate right who kind of didn't speak up and so you have a group of students who have a historical perspective that says in order for justice to advance we have to speak up we have to call out right so unprecedented levels of diversity, no coping strategies, but also a strong sense that compassion and empathy requires speaking out against, you know, various um, things that are unjust. And so putting those together, then you get, you know, particular high levels um, on the university campus of what some people call a uh, cancel culture because students are encountering, you know, they're encountering more injustice, right? Um, than maybe in their in their kind of high school lives. And they are now adults who have, you know, many of them convinced that they have a duty um, to, to, to speak out. And so, and I think as a university, right, we encourage students, you know, to, engage in the community, particularly here at Wisconsin, we, you know, law in action, you know, is kind of our motto for the law school. Um, and so we encourage students to, to, to speak up and to take responsibility for the world. Um, but I don't think we actually give them always the tools that they need to do that effectively um, when it comes to um, the injustices that are arising from speech. Great. Well, thank you again, Professor Coleman, uh, for your time today. I look forward to seeing you at the opening plenary the annual meeting and conference on June 14 in Milwaukee. Thanks again and bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>